بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار in the previous lesson we looked at the statements of imam at-tahawi rahimahullah ta'ala that relate to how a believer how he behaves with respect to himself and how he behaves with respect to the other believers and this is a combination of hope and fear a combination of hope and fear so a person hopes for the mercy of his lord for himself and for the believers and likewise he fears the punishment and anger of his lord upon himself and upon the believers and we started looking at some uh, benefits to be taken from these sentences and we got through four points i believe in the previous lesson from the explanation of sheikh salih al sheikh and so we're going to continue that discussion today inshallah ta'ala with the fifth point uh, the fifth point and the fifth benefit and this is regarding the statement of imam at-tahawi rahimahullah ta'ala if you look at the text imam at-tahawi said narju lil muhsinina min al-mu'minin an ya'fuwa anhum narju lil muhsinina min al-mu'minin an ya'fuwa anhum which means that we hope we hope for those who are the muhsinin those who do good those who are the doers of good amongst the believers that he pardons them that he forgives them now this wording if you look and reflect carefully upon this wording al muhsinin min al mu'minin al muhsinin min al mu'minin we see here a distinction and a separation between those who do good al muhsinin those who do good there, there are those who do good amongst the believers and there are those who are treated to be believers so this indicates that we have this indicates that we have uh, a number of different groups we have a separation of the people of iman this is essentially the point that we are making that there is a separation amongst the people of iman and amongst the people of iman there is the muhsin muhsin the one who does good and there is the musi musi the one who does evil the one who does does evil and so the point here is that irrespective of what type of person he might be whether it is a muhsin or a musi whether it's a a righteous person or a sinful person there isn't any condition attached as to whom for whom should we hope for whom should we hope for that person that allah's mercy is upon that person okay so the point that we're making here then is that when we speak of hoping in allah's mercy for the believers it is not it is not restricted only to the muhsinin only to those who do good rather amongst the believers there are those who do good there are those who do evil there are those who are upon a balanced middle way irrespective of which one they belong to for all of the believers we have this hope we have this raja we have this hope that allah has mercy upon them and when we look at the categorization of the people of iman we see that in the quran in surah fatir surah 35 verse number 32 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has divided the people of iman into three 
Allah says in this ayah, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابِ الَّذِينَ اسْتَفِيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَسِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Allah says that we may to inherit the book to those from our servants whom we chose. Amongst them is the one who wrongs his own soul. He wrongs himself. And amongst them is the muqtasid, the one who is in the middle way. And amongst them is the one who is foremost in doing good deeds. So when we look at the people of Iman, we see that the people of Iman are divided into three groups. And this is on the basis of what they bring, of the obligations, the obligatory duties, and what they fall into of the prohibited affairs. So for example, the ones who are the foremost in iman, the ones who are the foremost in doing good deeds, they do that which is wajib, they perform that which is wajib, and they keep away from that which is haram. They keep away from that which is haram. And on top of this, they do that which is mustahab, which is recommended, and they keep away from that which is makruh, from that which is disliked. So this is, these are the people who are foremost in good deeds. And then we have those who are in the middle path, those who are in the middle path, a path in between, and they are the ones, the muqtasidun, they are the ones who bring that which is obligatory and keep away from that which is prohibited. And then we have those who wrong their own souls. These are the sinful people. And they are the ones who fall short in the obligations. They don't do all of the obligations, the wajibat which are upon them. And they fall into those things which are prohibited. So, when we say the, when, when we say the, mu'mini, the mu'minun, it includes all of these three groups. And so when Imam al-Tahawi says... Here he says, نَرْجُوا لِلْمُحْسِنِينَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That we hope for the righteous ones, the, the, the ones who do good amongst the believers. This shouldn't be understood to mean that we do not also hope for the ones who are other than the ones who do righteous, righteous deeds, the ones who are sinful. Rather our hope is for all of the believers together. Now, this word, this word, when he says, Al-Afu, Al-Afu, which means pardon, Narju, he says, Narju lil muhsinina min al-mu'mineen, an ya'fu anhum, that Allah pardons them. This word, Al-Afu, Al-Afu, in Arabic, Ain fa wa, Al-Afu. What does this mean? This, and what does it refer to? This refers to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will overlook an individual for his sin. He will overlook the sin of an individual and he will not take him to task. He will not call him to account or he will not take him to task for the action which, which he did. This is the meaning of al-afu, which means to pardon, to pardon, to let someone off. And it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not take someone to task for a sin which he fell into. Now, this can occur in one of two ways. There are two ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can pardon a person. And the rest of this lesson is going to be looking at all of these ways. So basically there are two ways, there are two, there are two categories. The first way is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, purely out of His bounty and mercy and honoring an individual, out of pure mercy and honoring His servant, He forgives him, He pardons him. As long as, of course, he does not die upon shirk. As long as he does not die upon shirk, then Allah from his own accord, Allah will forgive him. 
without any reason coming from the servant. You understand? There isn't anything that the servant did. Rather purely from Allah's own mercy, he will pardon the servant. This is one way. This is one way. The second way is by way of a reason, by way of a reason or a cause. And this can arise you know, from, from the servant or from other believers or from other, from other angles. And we should look at, the, at this inshallah in, in more detail. So the point being here is that a person can be pardoned either by Allah's pure mercy and his bounty in and of itself, or it can be on account of, an, of a reason or a cause that the servant himself brings, that the servant brings from himself. So as for the first one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Qur'an, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Indeed, Allah does not forgive that partners should be set up with him in worship. But he pardons what is less than that to whomever he wills. So as long as you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without having fallen into shirk, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he may choose to forgive you out of his pure mercy. Pure mercy. So he wouldn't take you to task for your sins out of his pure mercy. If he wills, he will do that. And if he wills, he may punish you. Right. So this part here is purely out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the other part is on account of a sabab, a reason, a reason or a cause. Now, when the scholars, they looked into the Qur'an, and they looked into the sunnah, and they looked at all of the ways and means by which a sin can be removed from a person, they found there are numerous ways. In fact, there are ten ways. There are ten ways altogether. And the fact that a sin can be removed, the proof for that in the Qur'an, is in, 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 in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ Whoever does an action of evil, whoever commits evil, then he will be recompensed for it. He will be recompensed for it. Surah An-Nisa, Surah 4, verse 123. مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ Now, when this verse was revealed, when this, when this verse was revealed, it became very hard upon the Sahaba. It became very hard upon the Sahaba. It caused them a great deal of distress. And so when the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, when he saw that the Sahaba were under distress by way of this ayah, he said, he said that no calamity for my Yusibul Muslim bin Musibatin, there is no calamity that befalls a Muslim except that it becomes an expiation for him. It is something that erases his sin. Until even if he is pricked by a thorn, if he is pricked by a thorn, until even that, until even that, that level of, of, of calamity, a simple prick of the thorn, for which you, peel, for which you feel a very short, uh, temporary amount of pain, even that is something that will uh, remove your sins. So now the understanding of this, how do we understand the verse and the hadith together? The understanding of this is that when Allah says, مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا Whoever does evil, يُجَزَ بِهِ He will be recompensed for it. It means that there will be a, a calamity or a hardship or a difficulty which is a recompense for his action, for his, for his sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ 
that no calamity befalls you except it is on account of what your own hands have earned. Yet he pardons many. Surah Shura, Surah 42, verse number 30. So meaning that any calamity that a hardship or difficulty that comes to a servant in the life of this world, it is on account of a sin that he committed, and that calamity is something that erases that sin for him. That calamity you know, erases that sin for him. And this is the understanding of that verse. مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجِزَ بِهِ Whoever does evil, he will be recompensed for it. Meaning, by way of uh, calamities. Now, once we understand all of this, once we understand this, that it is a rule that sin will always be recompensed, as in sin will always be faced with calamity and hardship and, and so on and so forth, then what are the types of ways and means by which this sin is removed from a servant? And as we said, there are ten in number. There are ten altogether. And these ten, we divide them into three categories. There are three categories altogether. Uh, the first of them is from the servant himself. There are three reasons and causes from the servant himself that remove uh, sin. The second is three causes and reasons which come from the other believers. Meaning from someone besides you from the, from the believers. There are three reasons and causes that come from them. From them. And then there are four reasons. Or in fact, we can say there's another three reasons. Another three reasons which come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, it's four, uh, strictly speaking. There are another four reasons that come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we will look at each of these reasons in some detail, inshallah ta'ala. So the first category is the reasons and the causes which are brought by the servant himself. From the believing servant who is upon tawheed. And what, so what, what are they? They are three in number. So the first reason and the first cause brought by the servant is, of course, a tawbah. A tawbah is repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this tawbah is something that Allah has commanded in a, in, a, in, a, in a general sense, in a general way, and in a very specific way. We see in the Quran, in Surah Al-Tahreem, Surah uh, number... Uh, 66 I believe verse number 8 Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha O you who believe repent to Allah with a sincere repentance with a sincere repentance uh, this is a general command upon every believer to make tawba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until even the prophets and the messengers are commanded to make tawbah to Allah, meaning to return back to, to Allah and to leave that, that way. And the Prophet ﷺ used to say, وَإِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ فِي الْيَوْمِ مِئَةَ مَرَّةِ That indeed, I seek forgiveness from Allah and I repent to Allah a hundred times in a day. And likewise, so we see that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ used to sit in a single sitting, and would repent to Allah, he would say, Astaghfirullah wa atubu alayhi, a hundred times. And likewise, Allah says, Wa tubu ila Allahi jami'a, ayyuhal mu'minun, la'allakum tuflihun. That repent all of you together, O believers, that you may, that you may be successful. So, we see from all of these evidences, that tawbah is something that is commanded irrespective of whether a person is righteous and upright or whether he isn't. Right? Because you see here, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was ordered to make tawbah, and he made tawbah. So whether you, are, you consider yourself to be you know, uh, uh, not sinful, or your sins are very small, or whether you are less than that, it, it doesn't matter. Everyone has been commanded without exception to make tawbah to Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this then becomes the greatest of all reasons that a servant can perform, which is tawbah to Allah, uh, to, which, which remove his uh, sins, which erase his sins, until even if a person was upon kufr, was upon disbelief, and was upon shirk, or fell into shirk, or kufr, even that, even tawbah is something that erases uh, kufr and shirk. And we see even the worst types of sins that a person can commit, which are mentioned in the Qur'an, from shirk, and from killing a person, and from committing fornication and the likes. All of these Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgives because He says in Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th Surah, after He mentions these three sins, after He mentions these three sins, committing shirk, taking a life, committing fornication, he says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Except the one who repents and then believes and then, do, and then does righteous deeds, then those are the ones whose evil deeds Allah will change into good deeds. And Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحَا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابَ And whoever repents and does righteous actions, then indeed he has turned to Allah with a, with a turning, with a repentance. This is in Surah Al-Furqan. So even the great and major sins, even tawbah is something that erases and wipes them out. Now the meaning of this word tawbah, tawbah, what is the meaning of this word? The word literally means uh, raju'un, to return, to come back and to return. And there are a number of words in the Arabic language which define and explain this uh, uh, word tawbah, and they are as follows. The following three verbs. Aba, aba, and then taba, and then thaba. Aba, Taba, thaba. Easy to remember because involved here are the first four letters of the uh, or the first four letters of the alphabet. Alif, ba, ta, tha. Aba, taba, thaba. And all of these uh, have uh, a similar meaning. It literally means to return, to come back. Aba to return and come back. Taba to return and come back. They all have the same uh, meaning. So. But the word, the word, uh, there's a difference because the word aba, the word aba, re, is 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 a general type of returning. You you return back, but the word taba, taba, is a specific type of turning back, because it turn because it's a turning back from some evil that you did, right? This is unique to taba, taba, that you return back from an evil that you did. Whereas aba is just a general meaning of turning back. Right? It's not restricted to an evil, rather it's more general. So now that we understand that the word atawbah means to return back, it means to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the meaning of tawbah. If we break it down step by step, what exactly is involved in tawbah? It means ar-ruju ilallahi jalla wa'ala. It means that you turn back to Allah and you ask Him to erase that evil deed that you did. To erase and remove that evil deed that you did. This is the meaning of tawbah. It means to turn back to Allah and request Him to erase that evil deed. So this is the first reason. It is the greatest of the reasons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, قُلْ يَا إِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا O my servants who have wronged their own selves, who have transgressed against their own selves, do not despair of the mercy of Allah, for indeed Allah forgives all of the sins. Surah Al-Zumar, Surah 39, verse number 53. So the scholars have agreed that this ayah, this verse, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah forgives all sins. That this is, this verse was revealed with respect to those who make tawbah. 
those who are the ta'ibun, those who make tawbah, this verse relates to them. Now, th- that was the first reason. The second cause that comes from the servant is al-istighfar. Al-istighfar, which is seeking forgiveness. Now, seeking forgiveness, what is seeking forgiveness? Seeking forgiveness is that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to conceal the effect of the sin. The effect of the sin. When you say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, you are asking Allah to prevent the result of the sin or the consequence of the sin from taking place. Why? Because we know that every sin, every sin has a consequence. Sins have a consequence. Sins have a result. And the result is that they are calamities. A servant is punished in the life of this world. He's punished in the grave. He's punished in the hereafter. Why? Because all of that is a consequence of sin, of the actions of the servant himself. So, uh, and so we see that obviously there will be calamities that will befall him. There will be calamities that will come to him in the world, in the bazarkh, in the hereafter. And all of these are a consequence of his sin. Now, when a person makes istighfar, he asks Allah to forgive him, what he's really asking, and what he's really uh, uh, saying, is, O oh Allah, prevent the consequence of this sin from reaching me. This is what he's really asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's really saying that he understands that a sin always has a consequence. It must be a sin must be recompensed. A sin, a person must be paid for his sin, he's due for his sin. And this is a rule, as we said, as we said in the ayah that came before, مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ That we said earlier on. So understanding this, a servant, when he makes istighfar, he's really asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh Allah, erase or remove or prevent the effect, the athar, the consequence of the sin from falling upon me. So we see that the consequences of sin are very many. They are mentioned in the Quran, they are calamities. And the scholars explain in general that when we look at all calamities, whether they are diseases, uh, illnesses, uh, uh, you know, the you know, anxieties, the stresses, the loss of life, the loss of wealth, the humiliation, all of these are from the consequences of sin. And that's why Allah says, لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا خِزْيٌ That one of the consequences of the sin is that for them in the life of this world is humiliation. And we seek refuge in Allah from the humiliation of this world and the punishment of the hereafter. But this humiliation arises by way of the sins. So when a sin arises from a servant then it definitely has a consequence and an effect unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons a servant and this is the meaning of al-istighfar al-istighfar so hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask him but the meaning of al-istighfar really is or oh Allah conceal this sin prevent the consequence of this sin and do not humiliate by way of this sin, but prevent its consequence and its effect. So, uh, when we look at al-istighfar, and we look at tawbah, and we look at them both, really what we find is that there's a connection between the two. There's a connection between the two. And for that reason, in the Qur'an, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has combined between al-istighfar and al-tawbah. So for example, in Surah Hud, Surah Hud, which is the 11th surah, in verse number 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَأَنِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ وَثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ That you seek forgiveness from your Lord, and then you turn to him in repentance. And we notice that in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
has mentioned istighfar, he's mentioned seeking forgiveness, before he mentioned tawbah. In other words, he ordered them to make istighfar before they make uh, before they, before they make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this uh, raises a question. In fact, we see the same thing mentioned in the sunnah. Uh, the Messenger of Allah used to say, Rabbi ghfirli wa tub aliya. O my Lord, forgive me and turn to me. And likewise, he used to say, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. I seek forgiveness from Allah and I turn to Him in repentance. So, we see clearly that in the Sharia, in the Quran, in the Sunnah, Tawbah and Istighfar are connected. For Istighfar is mentioned first before Tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person makes istighfar and then you know, he makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we, ha- we can see clearly there's a link between the two. And so the way we understand these two uh, things, a tawbah and al istighfar, is that whenever istighfar is mentioned on its own, then we treat its meaning to be the same as tawbah. And whenever we see tawbah mentioned on its own in the Sharia texts, then we take its meaning to be the same as istighfar. In other words, the meanings are pretty much exactly the same. However, when they are mentioned together, like when you make the supplication, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Now here, the meanings are very specific. So, the meaning of istighfar in this case is that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you say astaghfirullah, you are asking Allah, O oh Allah, prevent the consequence and the result of this sin from taking effect. In other words, prevent the punishment of the calamity from arising, for, you know, falling upon me on account of this sin. This is istighfar. And then when you say, wa atubu ilayh, I turn back to Allah, you are, you are asking Allah then to erase the sin altogether. To erase the sin altogether. So you understand the, the, the difference here when they are mentioned together. Al-istighfar means prevent the consequence of the sin falling upon me. And then a tawbah is to erase the sin in and of itself. Right? So this is how we understand the uh, uh, two. So this now is the second way by which uh, sins are erased from a person, which is al-istighfar. So we have a tawbah and al-istighfar. The third is al-hasanat, which are the righteous deeds. Al-hasanat, which erase the evil deeds. And what is the proof for this? The proof for this is in the Quran, again in Surah Hud, the 11th surah. In the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَ يِنَّهَارِ وَزُلَفًا مِّنَ اللَّيْلِ إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْحِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَى لِلذَّاكِرِينَ ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَى لِلذَّاكِرِينَ Establish the prayer at the two ends of the day. At the two ends of the day. And at the approaches of the night. Indeed, the righteous deeds, the good deeds, they remove the evil deeds. And this is the reminder for those who, who remember. Surah Hud verse 114. 11 verse 114. And likewise, the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu he said in the hadith, وَأَتْ بِإِسَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا In the famous hadith, follow up an evil deed with a good deed and it will erase it and remove it. Now, now that we understand this principle, a question arises which is, does every good deed, is it the case that every good deed erases the evil deeds? Is it, is it the case that any good deed that you do will erase the previous evil deeds? And the answer to this is no. No. The answer is no. This is because when we look at evil deeds and when we look at good deeds, 
we see that evil deeds and good deeds have degrees and levels. There are the grave and the serious evil deeds. And then there are those which are lesser than that. So it's not the case that any good deed is going to remove all of your evil deeds. No, because only a good deed will remove an evil deed which is equivalent to it and of the same level and type as it. Now this is a very important point to uh, understand because when we look at... Um, because it also works, it also in fact works the other way around as well. Because evil deeds can invalidate your good deeds as well. So just as good deeds can erase evil deeds, evil deeds that you do will also erase the good deeds. It actually works both ways. Now the issue here then is that we said that it is like for like. An evil deed which in its gravity is equal to another deed which is similar to it in gravity, then they will either erase, they will erase each other out. Right? So as an example, when we look at the great uh, evil sins, like for example, committing corruption upon the earth, harming other people by way of shirk, committing shirk with Allah, or by killing people without, you know, killing people. These are from the great and evil sins. And these can only be erased by the great and the highest forms of the righteous deeds. Such as for example, jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, like Allah says, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu hal adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min adhabin alim. O oh, you who believe, shall I not direct you to a trade and a commerce that will deliver you and save you from a tormenting punishment? تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ That you believe in Allah and His Messenger and you strive, you struggle in the path of Allah with your wealth and your souls. Now this is being addressed to a people who had formerly been committing shirk and you know, killing people and fighting and so on and so forth and whatever. So the point here is that the gravity of the sin requires an equivalent of its like from the righteous deeds in order to erase it. And likewise, when you look at the major sins, like for example a person who steals and he takes wealth which does not belong to him, such as and likewise when he involves is involved in usury and interest, then there has to be an equivalent of that that will erase and remove that sin. Like for example, giving the zakah and giving the sadaqah. And likewise, when these sins are in relation to one's body, a person commits sins that relate to the body, the bodily sins, like the following of the shahawat and the lusts and the desires, then likewise the bodily acts of worship, the bodily acts of worship, will erase them, such as as-siyam or salah, fasting and the salah. So those good deeds will erase those types of evil deeds. So, you get the, you get the general uh, principle that when we speak of good deeds erasing evil deeds, this is just in a general sense. This is in, in terms of a general sense, we understand that the generality of good deeds erase the generality of evil deeds. But when we come and look into the specifics the specific, uh, the specifics, then it is not the case, for example, that you removing something harmful from the floor or smiling in the face of your brother is going to erase, for example, the uh, uh, oppression you did against somebody else or the wealth that you stole or the lusts and desires that you, that you followed. No, it's not the case. It's not the case that necessarily that every single individual good deed is going to remove every type of evil deed. No. Rather there is the element of, of proportion and resemblance and, and weighing and so on so forth, so on so forth which is involved. Now this is a very very important point to understand uh, for, for all of us because it shows that sometimes we can have a false sense of confidence that because we are doing uh, you know uh, good deeds like minor good deeds and doing plenty of minor good deeds that therefore somehow 
our major evil deeds that we may have fallen into, that somehow it's going to erase them. And, and so it shows that the danger of a person, uh, that, that a person might fall into, in that he thinks, he might have a false hope, that somehow his deeds will be erased. So a person shouldn't think like that, rather he should bring de- deeds, good deeds, that are the equivalent, that are the equivalent of his, of his evil deeds. Now the Shaykh mentions here uh, an incident uh, which is based upon a hadith which is not actually authentic, is not a narration which is authentic. And this is uh, a narration regarding uh, Zayd bin Arqam radiallahu anhu. It is a narration regarding Zayd bin Arqam radiallahu anhu. And what happened is that he participated in a type of transaction a type of transaction known as al-ina 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 is a type of transaction which is a type of usury it is a type of interest where you sell something for a certain price and then you buy it back later on at less than the price that you initially initially sold it so he sold a horse for uh, 800 dirhams and then he bought it back for 600 dirhams. And therefore he's profited by way of 200 dirhams in the middle. Now this transaction is a type of usurious transaction. It's called al-ina. Now when this reached Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, A'limu uh, Zaydan, inform Zayd, annahu abtala jihadahu ma'a rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inform Zayd, that he has invalidated his jihad with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, of course, uh, this here, uh, the Shaykh says, this hadith is, is da'if. Uh, it is not, to, it's, it's not uh, uh, it has an element of weakness uh, within it. Uh, but however, some of the people of knowledge, like Ibn Taymiyyah, they have taken the principle in the hadith, in the, in the statement, they've taken the principle which is that evil deeds can erase good deeds. And evil deeds which are of a serious nature can erase good deeds which are of a lofty nature. So this is the principle that is being extracted here from the statement, uh, from the statement here, uh, from, the, from this, from this uh, hadith. And in any case, there is an authentic hadith where this meaning has in fact been indicated. The authentic hadith in which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu he said, إِذَا تَبَايَأْتُمْ بِالْإِينَةِ وَأَخَذْتُمْ بِأَذْنَابِ الْبَقَرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرْعِ وَتَرَقْتُمْ الْجِهَادَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ ذُلَّ to the end of the to the end of the hadith the hadith is when you participate in al-ina transactions right which are the usurious transactions and you take hold of the tails of the oxen and you are satisfied with agriculture and cultivation and you abandon jihad in the path of Allah, then Allah will bring upon you humiliation. So, here we see a connection between the usurious transaction and the abandonment of, you know, of, 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 of uh, neglect of, of striving in the path of Allah. So, this principle can be derived from other texts in, in any case. So, to conclude, this uh, third type then, we are mentioning the ways and means by which Sins can be removed from a servant. The first one was tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second one was al-istighfar. Al-istighfar. And the third one is al-hasanat. Which are the righteous deeds which will erase the evil deeds. And within this there's an important uh, detail that we mentioned. That not every righteous deed is going to erase every type of evil deed. Rather, rather there is proportion uh, uh, in, involved. So... This now concludes our discussion of the first three ways and means by which sins are removed from an individual, and they are from his own actions, from his own actions. Now we move to the second category, the second category of three causes, and they are from the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala besides, besides the person himself. These are what are done by way of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they do these deeds for the benefit 
of other believing servants. And you can see here how the Sharia of Islam, it combines the issue of hope and fear, not just for a person himself, but also for other believing servants. Because we, you know, we, 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 we have hope in Allah, that Allah forgives us for ourselves. And likewise, we have hope in Allah that He forgives the believing men and women. And likewise, we fear from Allah, from Allah's anger and punishment for ourselves. And likewise, we fear uh, Allah's anger and His punishment for other believing servants. And this is why we are. This is why when you look at the words of Imam Al Tahawi, rahimahullah taala, and you look and you look at the words which he uses, that you know that we fear for the sinful people, and we hope for the righteous people. So you see, this is a collective fear and hope. It involves ourselves, and it also involves the other believing men and women. So for that reason, we see that from the categories, and from the forms and types of, of causes, by which sins are removed from a person, is that his believing brothers and sisters, they do certain actions which actually benefit him and from those ways and means they return back to three in number so these are things which you benefit from other believing men and women the benefit comes back to you so those benefits are as follows the first of them is al-istighfar al-istighfar and supplication for the believing men and women and so we see in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a proof that istighfar, it benefits. Allah says, الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ الْعَرْشَ وَمَنْ حَوْلَهُ يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا وَسِئْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا فَاغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَاتَّبَعُوا سَبِيلَكَ وَاتَّبَعُوا سَبِيلَكَ وَقِهِمْ عَذَابَ الْجَحِيمِ Addressing here the, speaking here of the angels, those who carry the throne and those who are around it, they glorify the praises of their Lord and they believe in Him and they seek forgiveness for those who believe. They say, O oh our Lord, You have encompassed everything in knowledge and mercy, so forgive those who repent and follow Your path and save them from the punishment of the fire. Surah Ghafir, Surah 40, verse number Seven. So therefore, when a, when a person makes dua for the believers, whether in the salah or outside of the salah, then this will benefit that person. It is from the ways and means by which Allah removes the sins of other, other believers. That when you make dua for a person, you mention him by name. Oh Allah forgive so-and-so. Oh Allah turn to so-and-so. Oh Allah have mercy upon so-and-so. By name or in general, this is something that has a tangible real effect by way of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erases the evil deeds of other people. And that's why we are encouraged to make dua for each other and for the believing men and women. The second way and the second reason is when a person, he does righteous deeds, the benefit of which can be given to others. Righteous deeds which a person performs, which can be given to others besides him. So he doesn't write, he does a righteous deed, uh, does a righteous deed, does an act of worship, and then he grants the reward of that to someone else besides him. Now this is an issue that we will come to look at inshallah ta'ala in more detail a little later in at tahawis Creed. But for now we should mention that in principle, that the principle that other people can benefit from your righteous deeds, it is an established principle in the, in the Sharia. It is an established principle in the Sharia. Now, there are some specific issues to do with, can you donate good deeds that you do? Can you donate good deeds that you do and give them to other people? And this is an issue in which the scholars have differed. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmullah ta'ala, is of the view that this is something that is permissible, and it is something that is permissible, that you, that you can do this. And he has a number of works, a number of small treaties on this specific subject. Uh, however, he, whilst, whilst saying, yes, you can, 
he does explain that this was not the way of the Salaf. Well, this is actually the essence of the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. That yes, you can donate good deeds that you do. It's something that in light of the general principles in the shirat, it's something that you can do. Though this is not something that the Salaf used to do. However, there are specific things which actually do have a proof in the, in, 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 in the sunnah, which a person can do acts of worship in which the issue of delegation comes in. In other words, where you can delegate someone to do good deeds on your behalf. And these are things like fasting. A person can delegate to fast on behalf of his father or mother who have passed away and they had fasting that was due upon them by way of an oath, for example, they might have taken and, and, and they had to fulfill the, the fasting. So, so the issue here now of delegation is acceptable. A person can fast on their behalf. Likewise, hajj, performing hajj on behalf of another. And likewise, performing sadaqah, giving charity on behalf of another. These are clearly and explicitly mentioned in the sharia, these specific uh, deeds. But as for deeds in general, righteous deeds in general, that we said before, then as we said, uh, that uh, th- th- there are many scholars who hold the view that you can donate them to other people, although this wasn't the way of the of the salaf. But anyway, in, in any case, we shall mention the uh, detailed discussion about this, inshallah ta'ala, a little later when we come to another statement of uh, uh, At-Tahawi, when he deals with the issue of making dua uh, and uh, charity benefiting the dead people. So in any case, this is the second way that uh, the righteous deeds of uh, the believing men and women can be uh, can benefit others, and the third way that we shall finish today's lesson with, inshallah ta'ala, is ashafaa, ashafaa, ashafaa meaning intercession, intercession, ashafaa, intercession. Now this intercession, by which believing men can benefit from, this applies to the life of this world. And likewise, the the, the, the the hereafter. And as for the life in this world, then there is a type of shafa'a that we all make for the deceased people. When a person dies, we make the janaza prayer. The janaza prayer in reality is in fact a type of shafa'a. Because the janaza prayer, when we pray the janaza prayer, we gather together and we invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show mercy and forgiveness for the person who has died. And this in fact is a type of shafa'ah. This is shafa'ah. And in fact this is explicitly stated in a number of ahadith which are reported in Sahih Muslim. By way of example, the hadith in which the Messenger Muslim said, مَا مِن مُسْلِمٍ يُسَلِّ عَلَيْهِ أَرْبَعُونَ مِنْ أَحْلِ الْإِيمَانِ إِلَّا شَفَّعَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ There is no Muslim over whom 40 from the people of Iman pray over except that Allah will accept their intercession for him. So here the janazah prayer has been explicitly described as a form of shafa'ah. And in another narration it is mentioned about a hundred people uh, none of whom associate any partners with Allah who pray over a person كُلُّهُمْ يَشْفَعُونَ لَهُ إِلَّا شَفَّعَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ Except that Allah, He accepts their intercession for Him. So therefore we see that there is shafa'ah in the life of this world. We can benefit a person by performing the janaza prayer uh, for him. And uh, of course the dua for a believer we already mentioned in the first one. Al-istighfar wal-du'a. Al-istighfar wal-du'a. This, this enters from the, the, the first one that we mentioned earlier on. But here we are speaking specifically of shafa'a. And so therefore shafa'a can occur in this world. And likewise in the hereafter as well. And so therefore we see that a father can make shafa'a for his son. And a son can make shafa'a for his uh, you know, for his for his father, and likewise the the scholar can make shafa'a for those whom you know are beloved to him, and all the ties of kinship they can make shafa'a for each other. All of this is something from the ways and means by which the sins are erased from the believing men and women, and of course the greatest of all of the intercessions are the intercession is the intercession given for the uh, to the Prophet 
sallallahu alayhi wa on Yawm al-Qiyamah, when he will make numerous types of shafa'a, uh, from which are those for the major sinners, that they be removed from the fire, and from which are those for those who were destined to enter the fire by way of their sin, but the intercession is made that they do not enter the fire at all. Right, so these are from the types of intercession that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu will make. And so these three types, Al-Istighfar uh, wa uh, dua from the believers, and the righteous deeds given by the believers, and the shifa'ah, all of these three are ways and means that do not come from the servant himself, but from other than the servant. And this now makes six causes and ways and means by which a person's sin can be erased and removed. And so with this we conclude today's lesson, inshallah ta'ala, we will conclude this discussion in the next lesson, inshallah ta'ala, when we look at the remaining four reasons and causes that erase and remove a person's sin. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. There's a number of quick questions uh, uh, that have come in uh, very quickly. The first question is that if a person prays witr before sleeping, can he wake up and pray a few raka'as of the hajjid? Uh, what we find in the sunnah, and the scholars discuss this issue, is that in the practice of the Messenger of Allah, that on occasions he did pray some raka'as after the witr, and this is established, and the scholars deduce from this the permissibility, the permissibility of praying uh, even after the witr prayer, should a person desire to do so, though it is superior and better to make the last prayer the witr prayer, because this is what is generally established to be from the practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the first question. Second question is: When a person goes to the grave of the Prophet sallam to give the salam, uh, can you say assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah? Then, in this case, the this, this is something that there is nothing wrong with this because here the ya of nida that is being made here is not the same as the, as the ya of seeking aid and assistance. This, this is simply the ya of mukhataba, when you are addressing somebody. And so there's a distinction between this and between, for example, when someone says, Ya Ali Madad, Ya... Uh, Peer Abdul Qadir Jilani, Al Ghoth, Al Madad, whatever. This is different. This now is you are you are invoking and calling and addressing someone for 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 calam for, for for aid and rescue in a calamity, and this is different. So yes, the, there is no issue here when you make this uh, du'a. And likewise, this is, this is similar to when we enter the graveyard and we make the uh, the, the supplication. Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al diyar. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum ya ahl al diyar. Uh, you know, assalamu alaikum, O people of this uh, uh, of this abode. So here, this 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 uh, uh, ya mentioned here is the ya of mukhataba. It is not the ya of seeking uh, aid and assistance and, and things of that nature which enter into into shirk. And uh, there was one other question that's coming through uh, the. This is an issue to do with uh, Al-Qada wal Qadr. Is that everything or is there more to this? Or oh, the two questions. The writing Al-Kitab in the second of Al-Qadr, does it encompass inclusive of the events that will happen to a servant when he's in the grave, on the judgment day, and in the heaven, or the hellfire? 
or is the writing only up to the death of a servant? From the, so the first question is the writing Al-Kitaba in the second level of Al-Qadr, does it encompass all of the events that will happen to a servant when he's in the grave, on the judgment day, and in the heavens, or the hellfire? Or is the writing only up to the death of a servant? From that which I understand Allah knows best is that when the pen was ordered to write the decrees, then in the hadith it mentions that write the decrees up until the, uh, the, 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 up until the hour, up until the, uh, whatever is going to happen, up until the hour. So from that, from that which I understand and Allah knows best, uh, that it refers to what will happen in the, the, the life of the world, and that may include the bazarh, because the bazarh is not from the hereafter. The bazarh is something separate from the hereafter. So that's as far as I understand, but to, to, but I, I would have to recourse and go back to the explanations of the scholars to check uh, the, the interpretation of this hadith and whether it carries this particular meaning or not. So with respect to that, then uh, Allah knows best, but what, it, what, what, what seems apparent is what I've just uh, explained. And as for the second question, Irada Kauniya is the syn- synonym of ma- Mashi'ah, which is correct. That the Irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we look at Allah's Irada, it is of two types. The Irada Shara'iya, this is the Irada by which Allah wants His servants to obey Him. The, the Irada by which He loves certain actions that He wishes and wants from His servants that they obey Him. So this is the Irada Shara'iya. And then the irada kauniya, which is the irada by which Allah wills things to come to be. This is synonymous or the synonym of Mashia. So the question is, is this Mashia is the same is this Mashia the same as the Mashia of Allah when the day when he will forgive and remi- remove those in the hellfire and grant them paradise and also on the day of judgment? Because some people say this irada this is irada kauniya. And this type of uh, Mashiach will only take place in this world and not in the hereafter. Is this a type of saying true? Uh, the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the Mashiach of Allah, is, is something that Allah permanent, permanently has. When we say Allah wills, Allah is eternally one who wills. And this is a permanent quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that, that, that that he wills And so therefore Whether we are speaking of A period before the creation of the heavens and the earth Or whether we are, whether we are speaking the uh, uh, During the existence of the heavens and the earth Or whether we are speaking after the heavens and the earth Have been transformed and changed And we are now in the hereafter None of this changes the fact that Allah is still one who wills, that he still has a Mashi'ah. And whatever takes place in the hereafter, when Allah wills for things to happen, Allah wills certain types of reward to come to the believing men and women in paradise, Allah wills for the people in hellfire to be punished you know, in, in, in a certain way, all of that is by the Mashi'ah of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of it is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, uh, it, to, to restrict and to limit the Mashia of Allah, which is synonymous with his irada kauniya, to only the life of this world, then this would this 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 would not be correct because these are permanent attributes of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Allah's irada, Allah, Allah Allah's irada, which is his Mashia, then this is a permanent attribute of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and it would be incorrect to limit it only to the life of this world. So this is the answer to the. Uh, question. So with that we conclude uh, our lesson today and inshallah we'll continue the discussion of our topic in at tahawis Creed uh, in the next lesson. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. So this makes six altogether. We have another four remaining. So now we move to the third category and we begin today's lesson uh, from this point. So the third category of uh, those affairs by which the sins of a person can be removed and the punishment of Allah can be prevented, then the remaining four, they all relate to the calamities 
which come to a servant. The calamities, the masaib, the calamities. And all of, all of these calamities are by, by way of Allah's, they, they come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, as it relates to the life of this world, this now is the uh, uh, seventh reason. The seventh reason, as it relates to the life of this world, then all of the calamities which come to a person of disease, uh, maybe death, as in death to a member of the family or relative, and likewise any sadness, anxiety, stress, decrease in wealth, a person losing wealth, all of these things which, by which a person's body or his wealth perishes, then all of these are uh, what we call expiators. They are kafarat. They expiate sins. And by way of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He removes and He expiates the sin of a servant. And the scholars explain that a calamity, any calamity in and of itself, it removes evil deeds in and of itself. You know, like we said previously, that when you commit an evil deed, may يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ It is a rule that when, a, when, a, when, a, when an evil deed is committed, a punishment must result. Unless it is removed by the various ways and means, which we are discussing now. And likewise, a calamity, any calamity that befalls a believer, it is a rule that a calamity in and of itself is an expiator. It removes evil deeds in and of, its, of itself. And this is because the calamities that come to a servant are not from the servant's own choosing. He didn't choose, he didn't, he didn't choose these calamities that came to him. They came to him outside of his power and his control. And they come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test his servant. And so that by way of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can remove the Evil deed. So in a way, when you look at it from this angle, this really is a, a mercy and a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith, the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, No uh, sadness, ma yusibu al-Muslim min hammin wala huznin, there is no anxiety or any sadness that befalls a believer, nor any pain, until even the, you know, like a small... Uh, like a thorn, the, the prick of a thorn. Even by way of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He removes and He expiates His sins. So for example, a person might feel some stress, some anxiety, his chest becomes constricted, and he doesn't really know what the reason is, and all of these things start affecting him, and so he starts becoming anxious and, and stressed and, 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 and so on and so forth. Then all of this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is one of the ways and means by which his sins are removed, whether they you know whether these calamities refer to you know himself or his wealth or his children or whatever else, then you know this is from the ways and means. Now another question is a question which follows on from this obviously is that when a person when a calamity befalls a person is he rewarded for that calamity or not? Now remember, there, there are two separate issues here. The first issue is, we've already established the rule, and that is that every calamity expiates something of the sins. Right? Obviously the size and the extent of the calamity will determine to what extent of your sins are removed by that calamity. Now, th that's one issue. The second issue is, are you at the same time rewarded for that as well? Right? So on top of the sin being removed, are you re is there any reward involved for that as well? And the answer to this question, question is that any calamity that befalls him, it removes his sin. That's the immediate direct effect for a believer. But then if he shows patience on top of that calamity, then he will get another reward. In other words, he will be rewarded on top of the expiation for his sin. And if he does not show patience, if he does not show any patience, then this will count as a sin. 
it will count as a sin. In other words, he becomes angry and displeased with the, the calamity, meaning he is finding fault with the qada and qadr of, qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the answer to this it depends upon how he responds and how he behaves uh, in, in relation to this calamity. So he receives two things from the calamity. If he is patient, he will receive the expiation of the sin and an additional reward on top of that as well. So this is the, the first type of calamity, the calamity, the calamities of the world, a loss of life, loss of wealth, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the calamities that come to the soul of, uh, of anxiety and stress and, uh, stress and so on and so forth. All of these are the worldly affairs. The second type of calamity, now this is number eight in our list. Number eight are the trials and tribulations and the calamities in the grave. In the Barzakh. And as you know, that it is from the belief of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah that there is punishment and reward in the grave, and a person is punished for deeds which he committed in the life of this world in the grave. And this is firmly established in the Sunnah. There are many things which are mentioned in the Sunnah on account of which a person is punished. And by way of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He further purifies a person, He further purifies a person, so that more of his sins are removed, so that on the day of, on the day of judgment, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, He comes with a decreased, lessened burden of sin. So in a way, we can look at it uh, uh, like in the first uh, type, the calamities in the life of this world, from one angle they are a blessing, because they remove sins from you and you can earn rewards from them when you show patience and likewise in the grave you would rather be resurrected on yawm al qiyamah with the least amount of burden as possible and that punishment in the grave is you know is something which also expiates a person's sins not that you want to arrive in the grave wanting to be to be punished of course at the same time we you know nobody nobody wants that so, anyway, in any case, that's the point number eight, the eighth affair. The ninth affair is what will happen on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, on the Day of Resurrection, when the people are raised and there will be many, many tribulations and calamities on that day. And they are mentioned in the uh, Sunnah from the people having to wait in the intense heat, standing you know, uh, being covered in sweat, being terrified of being held to account, having to uh, await the, the prospects of being given the scrolls. Is it in the right hand? Is it in the left hand? Is it behind the back? The deeds being weighed, having to uh, traverse over the bridge, over the sirat. All of the, there's many, many affairs which are from the calamities. Likewise, the retribution, the the, the, the things the things that will have to be settled between the believers any wrongs that were done that weren't settled in the life of this world all of these affairs are from the calamities and trials and tribulations by which again the sins that there will be expiation for a person in that so this now concludes nine of the affairs so three are from the servant himself three are from other than the servant and three are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is left one after all of these nine. And that one is the pure mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without the servant, without there being any reason or cause. Without there being any of the nine previous causes and ways and means. Meaning that a person may have committed a sin. Uh, he's he's came, come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a sinful state. And there is no uh, tawbah that was made, no istighfar that was made, there was no righteous deed he did that erased that, that, that sin, neither was there from any of the believers any dua or istighfar for that, nor did they offer him any good deeds, nor was there any shafa'ah, nor was there any calamity in this dunya or in the grave or on, on Yawm al Qiyamah. And there is left only the pure mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by that pure mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah forgives that servant. So this 
obviously shows the great mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this concludes our 10, the 10 uh, issues. Uh,